Hey everyone, welcome to City Church Live. I'm so glad to have you guys joining us today. We are continuing our series, Kingdom Kintsugi, and we're going to be looking at the life and the story of Moses and how God brought restoration to his life. I am so thrilled to be looking at this today, and I'm so glad that you guys are able to join us today. If you don't mind, <clears throat> if you don't mind, I'd encourage you guys to hit the like and the share button as well, so every and your friends list that everybody can see this message and what's going down at City Church. You are in for a treat. We're going to be having some awesome praise and worship. And then we're going to be looking at the Word of God and how God brings uh, restoration out of brokenness. So this is going to be a great time. Thank you so much for being here, but service is about to start. So I'll be back with you in a little bit. morning City Church. I said good morning City Church. Can we step to our feet? Anybody excited about today to worship our Father together? Come on. Look at your neighbor and say I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. Glory is 
said your love, you said your grace is more than enough. You said your heart would never forget or forsake me. You said I'm saved, say, you said I'm saved, you call me yours. Come on, declare it in this house. Come on, say it. Come on, say, you said your love, you said your love, never give up. You said your grace is always enough. You said your heart, never forget or forsake me. You said I'm saved, you said I'm saved, you call me yours. You said my future's full of your heart. Them, you can still trust him. Come on, listen to this. 
City Church, come on, can we give King Jesus a big round of praise in this place today? He is worthy of our highest praise, and what a privilege it is to have you for week number five of our series titled Kingdom Kintsugi. If you've been enjoying this series, come on, put your hands together, give the Lord some praise. And while you're there, take a moment and welcome everyone joining us online right now. Come on, wherever you're watching from, it's a blessing to have you with us today. Well, today we're taking a look at Moses. Moses was one of the most celebrated and venerated figures in the entire Bible. Uh, Moses emerges onto the scene 350 years after Israel relocated to Egypt. Now, during that time, the population of Israel grew from 70 people in the house of Jacob or Israel to over 2 million people. Let's take a look at Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. We're going to do a quick flyover of the life of Moses and drill down on one of the things that kept breaking in the life of Moses. We are creatures of habit. We, have, we are part nature and part nurture. And so as a result of that, there are cyclical things that tend to break in each of our lives. 
So today we take a look at the life of Moses. Let's take, open your Bible to the book of Exodus chapter one, verse number eight. Eventually, a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph and what he had done. So Egypt enslaved all of Israel and treated them harshly. Take a look at verse 12. It says, but the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. I wanna put it to you where you live. The more the enemy comes after you, the more you're gonna grow. Huh? If, if, if the enemy is not coming after you, if life is not trying to take you down a notch or 10 at a time, can I tell you what does not challenge you won't change you. But when you go through something, you're gonna grow. I'm preaching to somebody who needs to understand that God will give you growth through your grief. God will give you multiplication through your misery. The more that Egypt oppressed Israel, the more they grew. See, the enemy was trying to shut them down, but the opposite thing happened, and that's what's true in your life. When the enemy comes after you asymmetrically, and you don't know what to do, what you need to know is that God is growing you on the inside. God is growing your faith. God is growing your strength. God is growing your tenacity. God is growing your endurance. God is growing you on the inside because what the enemy meant for evil, God is turning it around for good. You are growing through your grief. The more they oppress them, the more they grew. The problem was, as Israel increased in population, they decreased in popularity. Let's take a look at verse 22, a shocking verse. Verse 22, then Pharaoh gave this order to his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile River, but let every girl live. He said that to his people. So imagine that you work for an Egyptian and you have a baby boy and they just come into your house, jerk him out of the bassinet and throw him into the Nile River. That's what was going on in this demonic atmosphere. You see, Pharaoh was trying to protect his throne, but Satan was trying to remove the seed of salvation that would come to the line and lineage of Judah. And so we see that during this time of bondage and oppression, a baby was born, a deliverer, a deliverer from God's people, from the evil hand of their Egyptian taskmasters. Write it down if you're taking notes. The outline is in the app today. In many ways, Moses' role in the Old Testament is a type or a shadow of the role of Jesus in the New Testament. Now, take a look at Exodus chapter two, verse two. I think this is a funny verse, um, so I wanna share it with you. Uh, chapter two, verse two, it says, when she, Moses' mother, saw that he, Moses, was beautiful, she hid him for three months. Who wrote the book of Exodus? Moses. So Moses wants the world to know, I was a beautiful baby. <laughs> I think that's funny. To save Moses from imminent death, his mother devised a plan that was actually curated, crafted, and cultivated by the Holy Spirit. The plan was not only save Moses' life, but the life of every Israelite, and as such, every person on the planet from an eternity in hell as the seed of salvation was coming through Israel. So in an attempt to save her child, she created a basket boat and placed him into the Nile River. Now at first, Moses did not believe that he was Hebrew, but as it turns out, he was just in denial. 
I'll wait for it. It's okay. The basket, sorry, the basket was found by Pharaoh's daughter, which was the plan. She adopted him, which was the plan, and raised him in the house of Pharaoh, in the palace of Pharaoh. Not only was Moses raised in utter opulence, but he was received 40 years of the highest level of education, 40 years of the highest level of military training, 40 years of the highest level of leadership training. Moses went to school at the Temple of the Sun, which would be tantamount to Harvard today. Uh, Cairo was the the epicenter of the world during that time. And the Temple of the Sun was the premier university in all of the world. Moses went there and he received what would have been a terminal degree. Today, you would have called him a doctor. Very, very educated. And God would use, I want you to see how everything that happened in Moses' life, every season in Moses' life, God uses. See, some of you think you're in a season right now that there's no way God could be in your season. God is so in your season right now. Oh, I wish I could get in between you and your makeup and tell you right now, God is in your season. God, if I could get in your grill right now, I would tell you God is in your season. And he's going to use what's going on in your season for what he has prepared for you. God is preparing you for what he has prepared for you. So God used the highest level of education possible for Moses to write more of the Bible than any other person in the world. Moses wrote in Hebrew, we call it the Torah. In uh, Greek, we call it the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And, And he wrote more than anybody else. Dr. Luke comes in second and the apostle Paul third. Sometimes people think Paul wrote more than Luke. Paul wrote more books. Luke wrote more content. Moses wrote more than them all. So, but you have to understand, Moses, while he was predominant, he was not perfect. While he was unprecedented, he was not unflawed. Moses' brokenness was linked to a deep-rooted anger issue that kept resurfacing over and over and over in his life. Christian counselors today tell us that 50%, 50 50% of the people that come in to receive counseling do so as a result of anger issues. Now, anger in general is not a sin. It's not a sin to be angry. Jesus got angry and he did not sin. The Bible specifically says, be angry and don't sin. However, Anger becomes sin, write it down if you're taking notes, when it's motivated by pride, according to James 1.20, when it's unproductive and distorts God's purposes, according to 1 Corinthians 10.31, or when anger is allowed to linger, Ephesians chapter 4, 26 through 28. So we're going to look quickly at a few of the anger issues that kept rising up in the life of Moses, and that left a wake of brokenness behind him. But in the end, we are going to see how the gold of God falls into the cracks of Moses' life. So when Moses was 40, he started to develop empathy for the, the plight and the pain of his people, the Israelites. And that desire to see God's people treated justly and fairly was a good and godly desire. But he stepped out of the bounds because of his anger. And so uh, one day he, he leaves the palace and he's walking around among the Israelites and he sees this Egyptian beating one of the Israelites. That's where we pick up scripture today. Look at verse 12. It says, after looking in all directions, To make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. The next day, when Moses was out visiting the people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up your friend? Moses said to the one who started the fight. The man replied, who appointed you to be our prince 
and our judge. Oh, are you gonna kill me the way you killed that Egyptian yesterday? And then Moses was afraid, thinking everyone knows what I did. Verse 15, and sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened and he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went into the land of Midian. So Moses travels a long way. He runs a long way to land in the, the, the land, the desert of Midian. While he's there, he intervenes again. There were a group of bandits that were about to uh, take and rape these young girls. And Moses stepped in and he beat up every last bandit. Uh, what, what ancient Egyptology tells us is that Moses was actually bad. Uh, Moses the prince won many military victories for the nation of Egypt as he was working his way up in their military. And so he was bad. I mean, he killed one guy just like that. Here, he whoops an entire group of people by himself. Now, in gratitude, Jethro, not Bodin, Jethro granted his daughter Zipporah to be his wife. And so Moses would spend the next 40 years in the Midian desert, in the shadow of Mount Sinai. Now, let me tell you, God is never going to waste a wilderness in your life. You see, it would be easy to take a perfunctorial preview of the life of Moses and think, well, that 40 years was just wasted. Nothing happened during that 40 years that was productive or uh, fruitful. You know what happened during that 40 years? He was the top level academic. He was a top notch military, hand to hand combat, military strategist, all of that. He did not know how to survive in the wilderness without his support team, all right? Moses had people that had people. Do you understand what I'm saying? He had to learn how to survive in the wilderness. Had he not known how to survive in the wilderness, then they would have left Egypt. They would have been in the wilderness for 40 years and and, and all of them would have died. Moses discovered how to survive and how to thrive in the wilderness during that period. God will never waste a wilderness. You know, you may feel like you're in a wilderness right now. I just want to tell you, no matter what that wilderness looks like, God is not wasting your wilderness experience. He is building something in you. He is putting something in you. He is instilling something in you. He is chipping away at your character until all is left is Christ. And when the end is all done, you will stand victoriously fulfilling everything that God has planned for you to do. God will never waste your wilderness. He'll never waste it. While running from his past, he runs right in to his purpose. He bumps into a burning bush one day and Yahweh, the I am shows up, tells him, I want you to go to Pharaoh and I want you to tell him to let my people go. Moses did not feel qualified. His knee-jerk reaction to Yahweh was to disqualify himself. He did not feel qualified. You see, failure has a way of lying to us. And the Lord told me that failure has been lying to some of you. You have lived like Moses in failure, but but you've become to the point to where failure now lives in you. So how do you get failure out of you when you have lived in failure? First of all, you need to know failure is not a person, it's an event. Failure is not final. And the way that you get failure out of you when failure is in you is you gotta get close to the I am. God showed up in this bush and and when Moses said, what's your name? He said, I am. That's the tetragrammatron. He said, I am Yahweh. I I am all in all. I am everything that you need. So the closer you get to I am, the more it's gonna defeat the I am not void.
voice inside of your head because you were made for all that God has for you. Your steps are ordered by God. God is going to use you even in your brokenness and through your brokenness. And come on, you ought to give God some praise in this place. He is going to put gold in the cracks of your life. So he goes to Pharaoh. Pharaoh refuses. God sends 10 sequential plagues to judge Egypt. Finally, the death angel makes its way, taking the firstborn of every household all throughout Israel, all throughout Egypt, rather. And Pharaoh says, you can go. When the Israelites left, they took the gold of their Egyptian taskmasters with them per the direction of God. They get to the Red Sea. <clears throat> As you know, God parted the Red Sea. Uh, probably more importantly, Yahweh wiped out the most powerful military force on the planet through the Red Sea. In fact, pictures today reveal chariot wheels resting in sediment. It's illegal to bring anything up from the Red Sea. But here are pictures that show chariot wheels from this era that were resting at the bottom, undisturbed, of this very place where the Bible says that they were slain. So now the Israelites are encamped in the shadow of Mount Sinai. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, they're in the same place that Moses lived for 40 years. And we see his anger rise again. Moses goes away to spend time with God for 40 days and 40 nights on top of the mountain. It's there that he received the Ten Commandments. By the way, in case you don't know, it, he downloaded them from the cloud onto his tablet. I just, <laughs> he was so advanced. I mean, you don't even know. This guy was so advanced. He comes back down, and during that 40-day period, they had elected a new pastor, started a false religion and were worshiping the God of the, of, of the golden calf that they had just created with sexual sin. Take a look at verse 19. When they came near the camp, Moses saw the calf and the dancing and he burned with anger. He threw the stone tablets to the ground, smashing them at the foot of the mountain. Now, Moses' anger was justifiable, but he let his emotions, his anger, push him beyond the boundaries yet again. In, in, in one moment, he broke all Ten Commandments at once. His anger kept rising up. But God kept blessing him. God kept putting some gold in the cracks. Aren't you grateful that God is a God of mercy? He's a God of tender kindness. He's patient with us. And he just keeps putting gold in the cracks in my life and yours. So God's repairing him with gold, but his anger kept a grip upon his life. Now, we're gonna look at the end of his life, then we're gonna do a flashback and then we're gonna come back there, okay? So take the journey with me. Buckle your seat belts, it's gonna be fun. Here we go. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse number 48. The same day the Lord said to Moses, go to Mount Moab, go to Moab, to the mountains east of the river, climb Mount Nebo, which is across from Jordan, look across the land of Canaan, the land I'm giving the people of Israel as their own possession. Then you will die there on the mountain. You will join your ancestors, just as Aaron, your brother, died on Mount Hor and joined his ancestors. For both of you betrayed me with the Israelites at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. You failed to, remember this phrase, demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel there. So you will see the land, God said, from a distance, but you may not enter the land I'm giving to the people of Israel. Among the many poignant and life transformational moments 
on a tour of Israel. Um, the war will be over at some point this year, and at some point we will get another trip going to Israel. And you'll get to have this experience if you go. Um, the Dead Sea is the lowest point in the entire world. It is 1,400 uh, feet below sea level. And it, the content of that water is so salt-rich, mineral-rich, that, that you float without anything. You just sit down in the water and you float. And so I remember sitting in the water, floating in the Dead Sea, looking up at Mount Nebo, thinking that's where Moses died. And then I, I rotated um, 180 degrees, like I was Tom Cruise in some type of movie. <laughs> and I looked out at Israel and I thought, that's the view that he would have got from Mount Nebo. It's pretty fascinating. But what happened at the waters of Mirabah Kadesh? Let's go there real quick so we can have a full understanding. Numbers chapter 20. It, this was nearing the end of his 40-year journey with the Israelites. So he's 119 years old, almost 120. And they're in the desert of Zin. There is no water. Israel turns against him and Aaron and begin to say, why'd you drag us out here to kill us? We're dying of thirst. Moses and Aaron go into the tent of meetings, fall prostrate before God. God tells them to go out and speak to the rock. Now, I'm gonna give you a clue in advance. The rock was emblematic, it was symbolic, it was representative, it was a typification of Christ. He said, go out and speak to the rock and water will flow. Now let's take a look at Numbers chapter 20, verse number 10. Then he said, he and Aaron summoned the people to come together to the rock. And he said, listen, you rebel. Can you hear how angry he is? He's calling the whole, you listen, you rebel. He shouted, must we bring water from this rock? Watch this. And Moses raised up his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff and the water gushed out and the entire community and their livestock drank their fill. Now, that's what God said would happen if he spoke to the rock. But look at verse 12. It says, but the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to, here's this phrase again, demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land I am giving them. And so we see that and we, we may think, well, that seems like kind of a harsh judgment given that he didn't judge Moses like that for any of the other things that he did. But remember, it's, it's very important to remember that Jesus was emblematic. He was typified by that rock. Uh, in order to further understand this, let's go back in time a little bit more to Exodus chapter 17, Moses was in a similar bind. All of Israel was complaining against him. You brought us out here to die. We don't have anything to drink. And he does the same thing. He goes into the tent. God tells him what to do. And this time God says, you need to strike the rock. So the first time God said, strike the rock, which was, what was it? It was emblematic of Christ. Strike the rock and living water will flow. Moses' disobedience disputed the holiness of God by breaking the model, by breaking the typification, by breaking the, uh, the, the illustration of Christ as the rock. Paul writing to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, it says, all of them drank the same spiritual water for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them and that rock was Christ. So Christ was typified, illustrated by the rock. Watch this. The first time God said to Moses, strike the rock. Christ was struck when my sin and your sin was placed upon him and he hung between heaven and earth. And when Christ was struck by a hammer and three nails, living water poured out from the Messiah for all humanity. But after that moment... 
Christ no longer needed to be struck, but simply spoken to. So Moses broke the mold. He broke the illustration. He broke the model of Christ when he struck instead of speaking. You see, Moses, in his anger, struck the rock the second time, and he broke the typification or the illustration of Christ by Moses disrupting the illustration of Christ. It disqualified him from personally going into the promised land. But I want you to see how even though he was not allowed to step foot personally into the promised land, I want you to see how God repaired him with gold. Write it down if you're taking notes. Moses' anger created brokenness in his life. But through it all, God repaired Moses with gold. Take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse number five. It says, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab, just as the Lord had said. Do you know that Moses was the only person that got a personal burial from God. Not even Jesus was buried by the Father, but the Bible says that the Lord buried Moses. He died on Mount Nebo. He was buried in the valley. The Bible says in verse six, the Lord buried him in the valley near Beth Peor in Moab. But to this day, no one knows the exact place. I wanna weigh in just a minute on that because it seems very interesting. Why is God playing hide and go seek with Moses' bones? You see, my opinion is that Lucifer, Satan, wanted to create a religion that would siphon people from Christianity and Judaism simultaneously. You say, is that just a guess? Well, kind of. But in the book of Jude, it says something very interesting. It says that the archangel Michael was wrestling with Satan over the bones of Moses. Again, I think Satan was trying to get Moses' bones to create a sub-worship of Christianity and of Judaism. We see this notion again, this kind of knee-jerk reaction coming from Jews in the first century in the life of Jesus. Moses was one of the people that showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's not like God is still mad at Moses. No, he shows up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He gets this elite invitation by God to join Jesus incarnate on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets, and Jesus representing the new covenant. But what is the knee-jerk reaction of the disciples? Lord, let us to build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Elijah, and one for Moses. Jesus shut it down. He said, absolutely not. It's because I believe there would have been this religion that would have emerged pulling people from Christianity to this other false religion. But through it all, through it all, God restored Moses with gold. I want for our servant leaders, our prayer partners to come forward at this time and be ready to receive those who would like prayer today. You know, we use a word and it's called justification. And, you know, preachers are always looking for creative ways to say stuff so that you remember it. We don't do that to be cute. We do it so that you remember it. It sticks in your spirit, your mind. And I know I've said it a thousand times probably that justification is just as if I have never sinned. But God showed me this week that's not true. It's not true. What Kingdom Kintsugi shows us is it's not just as if I had never sinned. It's that you are better than you were before you were broken. 
You are worth more than you were before you were broken, before you sinned, because his gold, and need I remind you that the gold that God uses is pure and transparent. And there's plenty of it in heaven. They use it for pavement in heaven. There's plenty of it in heaven. And that's what he's pouring into your life. Stand with, you, with me, if you will. I wanna pray for you. You know, the Holy Spirit has been highlighting different things in our lives. And maybe you today are in a wilderness and you need to come and join someone in prayer. Or maybe you have a struggle with anger or another issue. You could take that issue and you could alt control delete and replace any issue that we all have. We all have issues, we're all broken people. But now's a good time to bring that to God and to ask him to redeem it, to ask him to place gold in your life, ask him to restore you better than before. That's what God loves to do. Lord, I thank you so much right now. I thank you for your word, which is true, unchanging, eternal. I pray almighty God that you would let your hand fall in this place. God, move into our minds, our hearts, our spirits as we open up our brokenness to you, our weaknesses to you, our cracked veneer to you. Jesus, will you restore us with gold? Will you complete everything you want in our life? Will you make us beautifully broken. We thank you for that in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord some praise right now. How many ever been broken? Have you ever been broken before? But you still have a praise on the inside. I've been through the fire I've been through the flood Broken in pieces And left all alone But through it all God blessed me And through it all God kept me And I still Inside of me, yes, I still have a praise inside of me. Come on, choir. I've been through the fire, I've been through the flood, been through the flood. And left all alone. And left all alone. But through it all. But through it all. God bless me. Let me tell you what this praise. There's a praise in my spirit. In my spirit when you're in my soul. A glory, hallelujah, that I cannot control. And I still have a praise inside of me. Although I've been wounded, I've been scarred. I never gave up. I never gave up. I trusted in God. I trusted in God. But through it all, through it all, God bless me. Through it all, through it all, God bless me. And I still have a prayer. Inside of me, yeah, yes, I still have a praise inside of me. Come on, if 
Thanks so much once more for being here today. What a blessing it is to worship and lift up the name of God together. Amen. Uh, I want to encourage you guys. uh, Thank you so much for being here and looking at the story of Moses and how God brings restoration out of brokenness and can even redeem our anger. Sometimes that's a hard thing for us to deal with, but the Lord works. Amen. Um, I want to encourage you guys, if you are here for the first time, or maybe you would just like some more information, we would love to get to know you at City Church. So if you would do us this favor and text the word City VIP to the number 94000, it will let us get to know you when you fill out a little form, and then we can tell you about some awesome stuff that's going on at City and the ways that uh, God is moving here and how you can be involved as well. So I encourage you to do that. If you would like some information, connect with us at City VIP. Text that word to the number 94000. And look, maybe you're here and you're like, you know what, I've been here for a minute. I want to give to this ministry. We would uh, love and appreciate that so that God's work can go forward. There's several ways that you could do that. You can give on the app that we have. You just go to the Google Play Store, the App Store, and you can download that. You can text the word city to the number 888-364-4483, or you could go to our website and give securely online at citychurch.live slash give. However you guys choose to do so, we would just want to say thanks so much for giving and because of your support we're able to support over 50 missionaries doing god's work all around the world so your giving is making a difference until next week appreciate you guys being here god bless hello city church this is kelly and cindy robinette here in cambodia we want to send you a greeting and say thank you for all your support and let you know that God is doing wonderful things here in this country. And these wonderful children, we are just finishing up a Sunday school this morning. And they want to say thank you to you. So here they are. So thank you. Thank you.